our beloved professor S M Chitre, and thank you all very much for participating in this conference. Now I welcome our beloved director, Professor Vimal Kumar Jain, who welcome you all and also give his opening remarks. He is one one of the finest and highly accomplished inorganic chemist of our country, and uh, we are very fortunate to have a director like him. Uh, Professor Jain, please. Thank you, Sapanda. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is a great pleasure indeed for me to extend a very warm welcome to this August gathering of eminent scientists, distinguished delegates, faculty members, students, and honored guests from India and abroad. to the online three day symposium on the frontiers of astrophysics and fluid dynamics it is dedicated to the memory of one of our beloved founder members a legendary astrophysicist and a fine human being professor shashi kumar chitre he passed away on 11 january this year in mumbai after a brief illness Professor Chitre was an apt example of embodiment of modesty, refinement, and culture with a heart of kindness and empathy. Professor Chitre was a multifaceted personality, a scientist par excellence, a fine educator, and an able administrator. He made remarkable contributions in the area of astrophysics. particularly in the field of solar and stellar physics physics of neutron stars gravitational lensing and cosmology cosmology beyond research and education professor chitte harbored deep interest in art and literature being an extraordinary academician he was always concerned about strengthening higher education in basic sciences in india this has been a driving force to conceptualize a new model for imparting science education accordingly cvs was germinated as a result of brain storming discussions of dr anil kakotka then chairman atomic energy commission and secretary to government of india professor bezak khole then vice chancellor university of mumbai and professor chitre who was teaching in physics department of the university after his renunciation from tifr this is how cvs was created on the university of mumbai campus and started functioning as a teaching cum research institute on 17th september 2007 the center was recognized as a dae aided institute on 1st january 2016 professor chitre nurtured this center since its inception for almost 15 years let me tell you something about cvs cvs is a small core faculty and distinguished professor of international repute visiting an exempt faculty comprising of eminent practicing scientists coming from proximate research institute and organizations forms the backbone of the center this faculty contribute immensely to the teaching and research program at the center it enables student to experience first hand knowledge of the subject from expert in the concerned fields this is found to create an innovation driven ecosystem in which learning is made exciting driven by curiosity and creativity through new researches this enables us in grooming future scientific innovators in this context i humbly take a pride in mentioning that so far more than 225 students from nine batches have completed their msc degree and some of them have done exceptionally well in research in fact 
three of them who took up astrophysical research are delivering lectures in this symposium the center is making consistent efforts to motivate and inspire student to pursue their career in science and are also conscious about his commitment to nourish scientific talent in the country in short cvs has emerged as a low cost high quality science education model in the country two years back on this day that is 6 may 2019 when the faculty and hostel buildings were inaugurated i recall the joy and satisfaction professor chitre had on that day it was something like a mother seeing her crawling child standing on its own feet the kind of satisfaction he has on that day astrophysics and fluid dynamics were very close to the heart of professor chitre the last decade was very interesting for astronomy and astrophysics as four nobel prizes in physics were awarded to the work done in this subject area we are indeed fortunate to have two nobel laureates professor kip thorne and professor sir roger penrose who will be delivering lectures in this symposium non expert may feel the central theme of the symposium that astrophysics and fluid dynamics is rather disjoint but there is a close underlying interconnect between the two the equation of fluid dynamics are often applied in some areas of astrophysics in order to develop an understanding of several underlying phenomena giving birth to what is known as now astrophysical fluid dynamics there are lectures on such issues as well beside the ones within the in, within the individual domains we will have three most productive days of interesting and stimulating discussions with the world most renowned scientist who will be sharing their knowledge and experiences i appeal to all the students and young researchers to make use of those three days to best of their abilities let me conclude by saying that we are extremely grateful to all the speakers for their prompt acceptance and whole hearted cooperation overwhelming response till last evening nearly 2360 registrations were there in such a short span of time both from india and abroad and this has been very gratifying moment for all of us I would like to take this opportunity to express my sincere appreciation and gratitude to all of you. We are holding this symposium completely on a digital platform for the first time. All interaction will be now electronic in nature. Although no other mode of interaction can replace human interaction in this COVID pandemic time, this is the best we could do. i extend an open invitation to all of you to physically visit cvs after covid pandemic till then stay safe hope your presentation go smooth and interaction with audience in particular student become fruitful please feel free to ask if any problem arises hope new ideas will be generated in spite of an electronic barrier the at this time we really miss professor chitre for this webinar we know very well we have only made a beginning and though we have a pride in what we have achieved we have a long way to go the light professor chitre has imbibed in our heart will show us the path forward and with this i stop here and once again i welcome all of you to this webinar and declare the symposium open and thank you very much and i i return to thank you thank you professor jain for your message of hearty welcome and also message about cbs cbs actually has received the leadership of professor sm chitre 
and also its most stable directors the first director professor deepak mathur second professor rv hosur and now professor vk jain under their leadership cbs has flourished and it will flourish more and more now uh, we'll start the technical session and i invite professor amiya bhagwat uh, physics faculty of physics department he was the former head of uh, physics uh, school of physical sciences and he will conduct the session amiya please Okay, thank you very much, Professor Ghosh. Uh, we'll be uh, starting the first session of the day, and uh, I invite Professor Mustansir Burma, the former director of uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and uh, fellow of all the three Academy of uh, Sciences in India, as well as fellow of the third, the uh, World Academy of Sciences, and at present who is the uh, emeritus professor at uh, TIFR Hyderabad. I invite him to uh, chair this session. Over to you, Professor, uh, Professor Burma. Thank you, Professor Bhagwat. Um, thanks, thanks. Well, it's a great honor and pleasure to be chairing the first scientific session in this memorial symposium, which is held in memory of one of India's finest scientists, namely Professor S. M. Chitre, who unfortunately uh, passed away earlier this year. Uh, I just recall that Professor Chitre was a senior colleague at TIFR when I joined the Institute in the 1970s. Very soon I realized that he was an excellent physicist, a great teacher, but most important of all, he was great fun to talk to. He was ever gracious and cultured. He had a keen intellect and was fastidious about academic standards. I learned a lot from him, physics-wise and otherwise. He maintained an association with TIFR in later years, even after he joined CBS. And this proved very beneficial to the Institute, to TIFR in various ways. And I wanted to acknowledge one point here. Uh, in particular, he played a very crucial role in TIFR obtaining access to the scientific papers and correspondence of Dr. Homi Bhabha, which had remained a vexing issue for many years, Professor Chitre helped to break the deadlock. Anyway, now back to the session. Um, right, so as you know, Professor Chitre had a long standing association with Cambridge, and in fact, in particular with Churchill College. Thus, it's especially appropriate that the first speaker. Uh, today is Professor Christopher Tout from Cambridge and, and who also has an affiliation to Churchill. Professor Tout is the John Couch Adams Astronomer and Professor of Stellar Evolution at the Institute of Astronomy, University of Cambridge. He's associated, as I said, with the Churchill College. Areas of interest uh, include accretion to proto-stellar cores, mag magnetic dynamos, binary classes, evolution algorithms for interacting binary stars and dissipation of tidal energy during capture formation of binaries. Um, today, he'll talk about the origin of highest magnetic fields in white dwarfs. And I invite Professor Tout to deliver his lecture now. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Indeed, it is a, a great honor to speak in honor of Professor Chitri and uh, to take on this first uh, talk. I'll just uh, share my slides. Okay, I hope that is all clear. So as, as um, this is a particularly poignant time because um, it would be exactly now that, uh, that Professor Chitri or, or Kumar as we would, we would know him would start his two month visit, annual visit to the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. And um, here on, the, here on the left, we have the, the Cambridge crest. On the right, the Churchill College crest. Um, as, as was mentioned, we're both uh, members of Churchill College. Indeed, Professor Chitri was one of the very first students at Churchill College. He was one of the first graduate students in 1960 and is well remembered in the college. And he and his wife, Savanna, saw the college often as their second home and would visit every year. Sadly, not last year. And again, sadly, not this year. And it's also, also poignant in that about in March last year, I was due to visit the CBS 
along with some other colleagues, to work on the, some of the things that I'll be talking about. Suddenly, uh, things started to go wrong at that time. Anyway, we are still making progress, nevertheless. So, Professor Petrie, first, uh, I first met him in 1993, but uh, didn't really start working with him until still about 2010, when um, he started his, uh, his long-term collaborations in Cambridge, both with uh, Professor Goff, working on the magnetic field in the sun, and uh, with me and my students and colleagues working on um, other transport processes in other stars. And indeed, we were moving towards working with magnetic fields in all sorts of stars. I've had a long interest in the, the, the magnetic fields in white dwarfs. And so I'm going to talk mostly about those and bring in all the aspects of um, the collaborations with, uh, with Professor Chitri as we go along. OK, anyway, first of all, what, what is a white dwarf? A white dwarf is an end state of stellar evolution. It's, um, it's an object that uh, no longer produces its own energy. It's uh, supported entirely by electron degeneracy pressure, a quantum mechanical effect, whereby all the, uh, the lowest energy states are uh, occupied. Heisenberg un uncertainty principle says we can't occupy the states with more than two electrons, one spin up, one spin down. So in order to... Uh, as, as the star collapses under gravity, the electrons are forced into higher and higher energy states. That means that work must be done, and so that exerts a pressure, and that pressure can hold up the star. So rather than collapsing to a point, it, it is held up by this electron degeneracy pressure. As the electrons are forced into higher and higher uh, energy states, so they become relativistic. When they do become relativistic, they can no longer support the star. This was the maximum mass found by Shonda Sekar some time ago. Um, because all these uh, uh, the low energy states and many of the electron states are occupied, uh, if an electron is scattered, it, uh, it has a long ring free path before it can find another state to, uh, to settle in. That means that the, uh, the degenerate matter is essentially superconducting. Okay, so that for one thing makes the white dwarf cores isothermal, they tend to have constant temperature, but what's important here is it means that um, electrical currents don't decay. So any magnetic fields that we set up in the white dwarf remain permanent. So, so white dwarfs tend to be permanently magnetized objects. What do we see if we look at them? Well, uh, the surface of the magnetic field um, is pretty barren. There are generally hydrogen lines, uh, hydrogen spectral lines. Those hydrogen spectral lines can be affected by the magnetic field in Zeeman splitting. And this, this will allow us for some time to measure relatively low magnetic fields in white dwarfs. As the magnetic fields become very strong, so the Zeeman splitting becomes such that the lines start to overlap with one another and it becomes very complex. But we've, we've now pretty much um, disentangled this and very strong magnetic fields on the surfaces of white dwarfs can be measured. We're even getting to the point now where the, the structure of the magnetic field across the white dwarf can be uh, determined as the white dwarf uh, rotates by some kind of a process of tomography, where we have a, essentially high speed analysis of the Zeeman lines. What are the consequences of these uh, high magnetic fields? One, one really important consequence is that uh, if a white dwarf has a strong magnetic field, the magnetic pressure can actually hold the white dwarf up and that can assist the electron degeneracy pressure. And so we can exceed the chandra Sekar maximum mass. And this, uh, this has been, um, this has been uh, a, a problem for some type 1a supernovae. Type 1a supernova is essentially an, uh, a white dwarf that um, is approaching its maximum mass. And the, this, uh, in its center, it ignites carbon because it becomes dense. It's a, it's a type of cold fusion where the, the, um, the carbon ignites by density rather than temperature. If the uh, white dwarf is supported by an extra pressure from the magnetic field, then it can get much larger, much more massive before it explodes. When it does explode, it tends to all burn to uh, iron group elements and that produces the, uh, well, mostly nickel 56 and that produces the, uh, the energy for the type 1a supernova. So the more massive it is, the brighter the supernova. And the brightest of these type 1a supernovae seem to require 
white dwarfs that are much much more massive than the Chondrotheca mass. So getting there is important. One uh, thing, Professor Chow, Professor Chow, this is uh, Professor Barma the chair. There's a green uh, box that appears on your screen uh, yeah. uh, along with, with your material. I mean, it, it, it's okay. I, I see it on the left uh, upper part of the screen. So if you could remove it, it would be nice. Yeah, I think it's I, uh, What yeah. do you see now? Thank you. Back. Yeah, much better now. Oh, it's back. It's back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, but then I, then I think I can, I think I know what I did too. All right. Okay. okay. So if I if I do, um, yeah, this is better. No, it's still there. It's still there. Sorry, yeah. I'm not sure. Right. I'm not sure what is the cause. But do you tell? Because I, I'm afraid I can't see what what you see. Can you see it? How is it now? It's better. Yeah, it's perfect. Okay, okay. We'll, 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 we'll get it there. All right. It's, it's better now. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yes. Okay, so we're, we're, yes, yes. So, so we, we, we're, we're pleased that we can actually get these, uh, these white dwarfs massive. And I've done some work with, um, with group in, uh, in uh, Bangalore on this. We, uh, we make models of these stars. We're not, uh, they, at the moment, we don't know the structure of the magnetic field. So we have, to, we have to approximate the structure, but it's clear that we can indeed get these, uh, get these white dwarfs to be much more massive. They tend also to be less luminous um, because they lose their, their energy much more quickly, and that makes them harder to see. But uh, nevertheless, they could be there. Nothing, no white dwarf has actually been observed above the Chandrasekhar mass yet, but it is difficult to see them. Yeah, but there is the evidence from the supernova. Another, another important thing is that if we, if we strongly magnetize a, a white dwarf and the spin axis is not aligned with the, um, the magnetic axis, then, then they produce gravitational waves. And uh, we've also shown similar workers that um, these gravitational waves will be detectable by the uh, future proposed space gravitational wave detectors. And this may uh, give us the opportunity to distinguish whether some soft gamma ray repeaters and anomalous X-ray pulsars are neutron stars or, or white dwarfs. They're mostly probably neutron stars, but they could be white, rapidly spinning white dwarfs. And the production of gravitational waves would demonstrate that. Okay, now I'm gonna get on to onto how we might get the magnetic field into the white dwarf. So first of all, let's look at how do we form the white dwarf in the first place? So we need to, we need to have a bit of a background in stellar evolution. So I'll, I'll go through briefly how an intermediate mass star, say three, four, five solar masses, evolves and produces the typical white dwarf that we see. So on the main sequence, as, as in the sun, these stars are converting hydrogen to helium. Um, in nuclear fusion. Unlike, um, unlike the sun, they have a convective core. So this, this whole region in the center is convective during their, their main sequence burning. Ultimately, the hydrogen in that convective core is exhausted and the core has no uh, thermal energy to support it anymore. It starts to collapse. Um, and in the case of the sun, it will, form a, it will form a degenerate helium core. In these more intermediate mass stars, the core tends not to get entirely degenerate, but nevertheless, the hydrogen burning moves to a shell, this marked as epsilon h here, and as a consequence, the envelope swells up and becomes a giant. The star becomes a giant, perhaps um, not, not quite reaching the radius of the Earth's orbit, in this case, if it were the sun, but um, getting reasonably close. If, if we were to remove all of that hydrogen envelope at this time, the burning shell would go out and we'd be left with this helium core, which would continue to cool and become degenerate and leave a helium white dwarf. Typically white dwarfs lose the envelope of the star at this point. In order to lose the envelope of the star at this point, it really needs to be, have a binary companion that sucks off the, the envelope, but more on binaries later. Okay, so what, uh, what happens next is it, uh, it uh, gets hot enough in the center to ignite helium. In the case of the sun, this would be degenerate helium ignition, but these intermediate mass stars, it is, it's much more gentle. And we, uh, we end up now, again, with a convective core, this time burning helium in the triple alpha reaction, four, uh, sorry, three helium nuclei forming a carbon nucleus. It's then very easy to add a, an extra carbon nucleus and make oxygen 16. So we're, we're, we're essentially converting 
this helium to carbon and on to oxygen in this, in this degenerate core. Hydrogen burning continues in, um, in a shell, but in, while this is happening, the star, the star cools and the envelope becomes radiative again and the star becomes much smaller, ceases to be a giant. Again, we get, the point, get to the point where the helium fuel in the center is exhausted. And this time, um, the, uh, the core starts to collapse again. The helium burning continues in a, uh, a thin shell. Um, there's, a, there's a helium rich region in between that and a hydrogen burning shell. And again, the outer parts expand to become a large red giant, this time called an asymptotic giant branch star but, and uh, reaching much larger radii. In the case of the sun, it reaches about the, the radius of the Earth's orbit at the, uh, during this stage of its evolution. Um, what's going, what happens at this point is that the star, because the star is very large, because it is also very luminous, it starts to lose a lot of mass from its envelope. And it's at this point that the envelope can indeed be expelled. Another process occurs because, essentially because the helium burning takes place faster than the hydrogen burning. So these, these two shells, the helium burning shell actually catches up with the hydrogen burning shell. So we have just a very thin layer left in between. And interesting things can happen in that layer, uh, causing thermal pulses, which I, I won't get into now. But because it's a very thin layer, once we've removed that envelope, we're just left with this carbon oxygen core. This is, it's exhausted here. In a more massive star, it could go on to ignite carbon, but in these intermediate mass stars, it doesn't, the ones that are going to produce the white dwarfs, it just leaves a carbon oxygen core. That carbon oxygen core cools and is supported by the electron degeneracy pressure, becoming the white dwarf. Okay, so now we're interested in how we get these magnetized. But first, first let's have a, let's, let's have a look at um, some of the work that I did with, uh, with Chi Chi and the student Potter and then went on to do, uh, to continue work with other students. I don't want to get into too many of the, the mathematical details here. As I said, uh, Chichi, uh, Chichi's work was, was quite centered on the sun, and he was very, he's been very interested in working on the, the magnetic field in the sun and the links between the magnetic field in the sun and differential rotation with Professor Goff in Cambridge. Um, but uh, we, we, wanted to, we wanted to extend this to other stars. We, in the sun, of course, these processes are happening on very short time scales. But in stellar evolution, we're interested in much longer time scales. The solar, the, um, the solar sunspot cycle is over in 22 years. And the sun is going to take 5,000 million years to, to evolve to become a giant. So um, we're, we're interested in very long term processes rather than these short term processes. And that, that makes it rather, rather difficult to model them because we have to make approximations and Often we don't understand the physics, and even if we do understand the physics, it's hard to, to get the right means of converting it to, to a, a long-term evolution. Particularly, as it was at this time, when we were working only with one-dimensional models, because its um, stellar models at the moment are essentially all still one-dimensional, um, spherical, of course, but we can put in some perturbations to, to um, give them some asphericity, but nothing, nothing serious. And so if we're going to model differential rotation, we can only model differential rotation um, as a function of, uh, of radius. Whereas of course in the sun, we see that it's also a function of, of uh, latitude. So we're already making a, a serious approximation there. The magnetic fields, uh, and certainly in the sun, are showing an enor enormous amount of time varying small scale structure. But what we're interested in here is, is the long-term evolution of the magnetic field. And in particular, if we want to know what's going to be left in the white dwarf, we want to know the large scale magnetic field that's left over at the end of the evolution. So in, in the details, we, we model the magnetic field in two parts, a, a toroidal part, B phi, which, is, um, which runs around the axis of the magnetic axis and a, um, a poloidal part, um, which in the, the first order is simply a dipole magnetic field um, with the same axis here. And because we're working in one dimension, we're assuming a single axis as well. We have to work with, as I've said, with differential rotation as a function of radius only. And we're interested only in the large scale fields, 
not, not the small perturbations. So a number of approximations have been made here. Angular momentum transport is important. Obviously, if we want to know how the differential rotation varies because differential rotation is going to be critical for setting up the magnetic field. The star, the star is evolving. The, star, the radius uh, as a function of mass is changing all the time. So if a star started off rotating, a differential rotation is automatically um, in, in, uh, introduced. The, the star is constantly trying to reach the lowest energy state of um, uniform rotation. Um, there are um, the, the heat transport, because heat transport is, is, tends to be radial against gravity while we've got a, a spin along another axis, we end up introducing a, a meridional circulation. So the, um, so the Shelley rotation is quite, quite a poor approximation, in fact, and there is a large scale long-term meridional circulation, but we can, we can put that in artificially. And um, when we include our, ma our magnetic fields as well, the magnetic fields introduce a Maxwell stress Essentially, if we have, um, if we have a, a radial field in the star and we have differential rotation, we're going to start stretching those magnetic field lines and that provides a stress that tends to, um, uh, towards uniform rotation. So these things are incorporated in this, um, in this rather messy equation. We have, a, we have the Maxwell stress term here and we have um, a standard uh, Rayleigh, Rayleigh Taylor stress here. In, in radiative zones, various instabilities are important. The Rayleigh-Taylor instability probably dominates. In convective zones, where we have complete mixing, where the star, the star is essentially um, simmering away, we have mixing of um, angular momentum throughout the star. And so we, convective mixing takes over that diffusion of angular momentum. What about the magnetic fields? Well, the magnetic fields, on, the, on this large scale, we use an induction equation. The conversion of a uh, of, um, poloidal field, to toroidal field is straightforward. If we, have, um, if we have differential rotation, as I said, if we have um, a radial field in the star, the differential rotation stretches those field lines and converts them to uh, a component around the axis, a toroidal component. So this is, this is uh, commonly known as uh, the omega part of a dynamo and is, is reasonably understood. To, get to, the, to close the dynamo, we have to convert back from the toroidal field to the poloidal field. And this is, this is where the physics is, is still relatively poorly understood. Um, we, we know that we can't have, a, we can't have an actually symmetric dynamo. Um, so, so we have to approximate. And what we do is we introduce some kind of alpha effect, some alpha dynamo. Essentially, we have the generation of poloidal field uh, proportional to the, um, the toroidal field. Okay. Another term that's important and will be very important for our white horse is the, is the diffusivity. So this, this, this eta here and this term is allowing magnetic field that exists in one part of the star to diffuse out of that part of the star generating magnetic field in other parts of the star or dissipating it completely. Um, in, the, in the radius regions of the star, uh, the magnetic, there are various instabilities, which I won't go into. Uh, if you want to look at, uh, discussed by Taylor in 1973. And again, in the convective regions, we're mixing everything up. So the, um, so the convective mixing produces that, uh, that magnetic diffusivity. Uh, the, the alpha dynamo encapsulates, as I've said, the physics that we don't really understand. Um, it depends on the differential rotation. It depends on this omega a is the, um, the alpha uh, frequency of the, of the poloidal field. And this, um, this is the brunt basila frequency that determines whether the star is, uh, is convective or not. So it depends on all of these things. And it depends on some unknown efficiency gamma. And in all of these models, in any model of magnetic fields that you find in stars, there's, there's always this unknown gamma. Unfortunately, it, it can be quite important, although we, we find in some cases it, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter so much. Okay, so without going into details, let's look at what happens in a star towards the end of its evolution. 
So what I what I'm showing here is the this is the mass of the star. This is a three solar mass star. The center the center here and the the outside over here. This is at the this is in this very last stage of its evolution when it's on the asymptotic giant branch. So it has um, it has the carbon oxygen core, which in this case is already degenerate. It's already becoming a white dwarf. That that is. That is, that is in this region below about 0.5 solar masses. It has then, then the, uh, uh, the helium burning shell and the hydrogen burning shell and the region in between. The hydrogen burning shell is about here where we see these, um, these magnetic field lines dropping off. Now what I'm, what I'm showing you here are various times since the end of the helium, core helium burning phase. So this is, these, are, these are the times in millions of years since the, um, the time when the helium in the center was exhausted. And at that point, this green line shows us the, the structure of the magnetic field through the star. Now, obviously we've gone through a lot of the evolution at this point. It is, it is actually able to remember something of, um, of the, the initial rotational velocity that it had. So if, it, if the star were rotating faster, then this, this magnetic field at this point would actually be, be higher. Um, what we find at this critical point is that we've actually got quite a lot of differential rotation going on inside, in, in the region between the two burning shells. And so we're generating a strong toroidal field here as we go on. And what we're also seeing is that that toroidal field is diffusing by the magnetic diffusion into the core. And so we are able during the latter stages of the, of the evolution, according to this model at least, to see the magnetic field diffusing into the white dwarf. So if we have, if we have a, a, a strong magnetic field outside the white dwarf generated perhaps by differential rotation, we can see it diffusing in. Now, um, if we go back, uh, 20, 30 years, it was, it was indeed believed that the, um, the magnetic fields in white dwarfs were remnants of what they had when they were on the main sequence. So if we look at these, uh, these intermediate mass stars when they're on the main sequence, we're looking at uh, A stars. The A peculiar stars have much stronger magnetic fields than other A stars. And it was, if you conserve the magnetic flux of those, those A P stars, you tend to produce the, the magnetic fields that are seen in, in the most magnetic white dwarfs. So, so that was, it was thought that this, this was indeed a process that works. But I'm going, to, I'm going to mention binary stars shortly, and we'll see that it's a complication that really means that this is, it's much more interesting than this. Okay, okay so, so binary stars. The vast majority of stars are in binary systems. We, we now know that. Sun is unusual in not being in a binary system. Their periods range from um, a few hours in some of the systems I'll talk about in a moment, the cataclysmic variables, to millions of years. And the close ones can interact. They certainly interact by tides in the same way that the moon produces tides on the Earth. If they're close enough, the tides can become so strong that the material actually flows from one star to the other, and we get, uh, we get processes of mass transfer. But also, there are many, many very wide binaries that don't interact at all. And a key, a key point here is that these ought to evolve as single stars. So if, if magnetic fields are produced in single stars in a certain way, they ought also to be produced in the stars, the companions, the components of these wide binaries in the same way. Okay. Now, I'm going to talk about the cataclysmic variables, so I, I'll show you what they are. A typical cataclysmic variable has a white dwarf. All cataclysmic variables have a white dwarf that is accreting material. And typically they have, they have a very low mass uh, companion, about half to, half to one solar mass. That is so close, it's filling its Roche lobe. The material at the surface of this star is more attracted to the companion than to itself, and it overflows. It, uh, it overflows in a stream. Once it, once it enters the stream, it flows ballistically. It would uh, encircle the white dwarf. The white dwarf is very small, so it would just go around the white dwarf, collide with itself, and form a, a ring of material that then spreads out into an accretion disk. In the accretion disk, we have 
angular momentum transferring itself outwards while material is flowing inwards and that material accretes onto the, onto the star in the center. And most, most cataclysmic variables are of this sort. A very interesting type, however, are the, are the magnetic cataclysmic variables. And the most magnetic of these are the M Hercules systems. In these, the white dwarf is highly magnetized. We're going to talk a bit more about what, what we mean by highly magnetized dwarfs in a moment. But this, this um, the, white, the magnetic field on this white dwarf is so strong that it, it links with the material at the surface of the companion. So rather than flying on a ballistic stream around the white dwarf, the material is funneled along the magnetic field lines and falls onto a, a point near the magnetic pole and a point on the other side, possibly. Because of this, these, uh, uh, there's a lot of kinetic, uh, kinetic energy loss when this material hits the surface of these stars. So they get hot and they emit x-rays. So these, these systems are, in fact, actually fairly easy to find. But these have, these have extremely strong magnetic fields. So let's, let's just look at um, what, what we see when we look at the magnetic fields of white dwarfs. Okay, so generally, there are many where we can't, we can't detect a magnetic field at all. And they go up to as much as um, 10 to the 9 gas. That's a really strong magnetic field. And there, the Zeeman splitting lines are very uh, quite hard to distinguish, but it's, um, we can work it out numerically. I'm going to, for a moment, just distinguish between what I'll call low magnetic fields, which are those below a million gauss, and high magnetic fields above a million gauss. And they, there does seem to be a bit of a dip around a million gauss. That's why I split them there. The, the low fields typically less than 10 to the 5 gauss. Now, in the magnetic cataclysmic variables, the ones, the, the AM Hercules systems I've just spoken about, where the, the magnetic field is strong enough to funnel the material along the magnetic field lines, these, uh, these are very strong. These are 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8 gas. There are some known as intermediate polars where they're not quite strong enough to funnel the material from the companion, but they, they, um, they break up the inner part of the accretion disk. These are known as intermediate polars, but they also would count as... Um, high field systems. Notice, notice that uh, these only go up to about 10 to the 8 gauss. These very, very uh, magnetic ones tend to be single. And that, that also is an interesting point, which we need to explain. Okay, so let's, so suppose we, suppose we look at um, the distribution of magnetic fields in white dwarfs. Right. The most important uh, line here is, is what we see in the wide binaries. I've said that uh, the stars in the wide binary should be evolving just as single stars. So if, we, if, high fields, if high magnetic fields are indeed simply diffused into the white dwarf from the earlier evolution, then we ought to see as many of uh, these high magnetic fields in wide binaries as we do in, in the close binaries. These are the semi-detached ones, the ones that are actually transferring mass or indeed in single stars. But there is ample evidence now, from mostly from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, that none of these wide binaries have high magnetic fields at all. So in fact, they're all low magnetic fields. In the case of the semi-detached ones, where, we are, where I'm mostly talking about the cataclysmic variables now, and remember there's, there is some observational bias here, because as I said, it's very easy to actually detect these uh, AM Hercules systems because they're X-ray sources and variable X-ray sources at that. Uh, but we see, we, we suddenly see many more high field white dwarfs compared to the low field white dwarfs. And then the other point that I mentioned, the very highest ones tend to be in single stars. So even so isolated single white dwarfs, about 10% have high magnetic fields. And this is where we're also finding the highest of the magnetic fields. So this immediately suggests to us that, um, that there is a connection between the, the highest magnetic fields and duplicity, the fact that the, the star has been or is part of a binary system now. I would argue that if, you, if, we, have a, if we look at completely single stars, um, because most stars are formed in binaries, it's very likely that some of these single stars have merged and uh, were once binaries in the past. And that's how I'm going to explain those higher field magnetic fields, those high, high field magnetic white dwarfs in the single stars. Okay, 
back to back to our cataclysmic variable again. Now that white dwarf. Remember from the beginning we were talking about um, the the stellar evolution. We didn't produce our carbon oxygen white dwarf until our star had actually been almost the size of the Earth's orbit. And our cataclysmic variable, because it has a low mass companion, has a separation that's only about the radius of the sun. So we've somehow got to get from that very wide system uh, that was able to grow the white dwarf in the first place down to that uh, tiny system that's only a solar radius across and we can, and can transfer mass to the, the companion. And this, this has been a puzzle since, uh, since it was realized that this was a problem back in the 1970s. Um, Paczynski then proposed a, a, a process called common envelope evolution that remains one of the, the least well understood processes in stellar evolution, binary star evolution, but one of the most important, whereby the massive giant starts to overflows its Roche lobe, but as it does so, it actually expands more and it swallows the companion. And then the two cores, that's the, the dense companion because the envelope is very thin because it's very large and the, uh, the white dwarf spiral together. And they either merge or they leave, the, um, they leave the two systems separated but close enough that by some kind of magnetic breaking or gravitational radiation, they can be driven together and produce the, um, the, the cataclysmic variable. Okay. So my hypothesis for the formation of these high field magnetic white dwarfs is that they actually get frozen in during this common envelope phase. Um, so, and this, so the closer they get, the more differential rotation there's likely to be near the surface of the white dwarf and we can diffuse magnetic field in. And the strongest fields we get are in those systems that are actually forced together and merge. So there we have a lot of differential rotation in a merged star at the surface. Okay, uh, this, this hypothesis came back in 2008. It's, uh, it's stood the test of time a bit. A few, a few others have come up, but we still don't really understand the final result yet. But it, I think we can be certain that something to do with uh, duplicity is concerned. Okay, moving on. Um, one thing we would really want to do is to make two-dimensional, three-dimensional stellar models. And this, was, this is where a lot of the work that I was recently doing with Chichi came in into its own. And um, in, in order to evolve stars over long periods of time, we can't, we can't look at the, the microphysics in detail. So if we, look at, if we try to make a, a multidimensional stellar model, it tends to be hydrodynamic and, we're, and run on dynamical timescales at the moment. So we're talking about um, uh, hours, days, years, in the case of giants, compared with uh, millions, thousands of millions of years for the actual evolution time or even the thermal time scale of the star. So we, so we can't do that. So we have to have approximations. And we already do this in single stars for our convective mixing length theory. Um, if we're going to look at uh, multidimensional stars, rotating stars, then we need to, our uh, mixing length theory has to become isotropic. And this is where a lot of the work um, that I did with Chi Chi, both in Cambridge and indeed in CBS, was involved in. Um, in order to look at uh, the changes in differential rotation, we must also include angular momentum transport. So we, we, we did that. The final part of this picture was to put in the magnetic field. And it was in, in March 2020 that I was to, to visit CBS uh, along with, uh, with Adam Jamin and uh, Pierre Lesafra may have joined us. And we were going to, we were going to put, start the work on the, on the magnetic field evolution. I know that Chichi has some ideas and we have those ideas on paper. We will hopefully work on this and remember him greatly, but his, his contribution would have been invaluable here. Okay, right, I'm reaching the end of the time, so I better conclude. White dwarfs can be highly magnetized and they have interesting consequences for their properties. I've mentioned those at the beginning, uh, particularly for exceeding the Chandrasekhar seco mass, also producing gravitational waves. The, if we look at the distribution of these highly magnetized white dwarfs, we see that uh, their uh, formation must be intimately tied up with the fact that they have binary companions, their duplicity. And um, for the future, we want, to, we want to actually start making two or three dimensional models 
that will be the next step forward. And as always, Chicho will be missed. His contributions to this have been invaluable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Taut, for a most enlightening and very clear talk uh, on the role of magnetic fields, particularly in binaries. And uh, uh, perhaps if there are a couple of questions, we can take them. Uh, so uh, could I ask uh, the organizers to pass them on? Yes, just a second. Right. So. So one question that we have in the chat is, uh, could you give a physical intuition of the small scale and large scale effects of the magnetic field? Okay, well, the, the, small, the small scale effects are, tend to be what we observe. So certainly in the sun, I would say small scale effects are producing sunspots, such like that. We see, um, we see spots on other stars. The large scale, uh, are the things that can actually change the bulk properties of the star. So we could, um, we can uh, increase the size of the star, the mass exceeds the Chandrasekhar mass. So those are, those are two examples. Okay. Um, other questions? Uh, organizers? Um, Professor Mustamsa, you may have received the questions in chat. Uh, okay, yes, yes, now I see them, all right. So, Professor Tau, there's another question. Does the existence of white dwarfs with super Chandrasekhar mass limit imply that we can no longer use type 1 supernovae as standard candles in cosmo cosmological measurements? Uh, um, not, not, not really. In fact, in fact, not at all. The, 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 um, the, there is a calibration between the, the decay of the light curve and the, the brightness of the supernova. And most of the supernovae tend to tend to have, have very similar brightness anyway. The it was always the outliers, the very bright ones, that were that fitted. They, they actually fit the same the same calibration, so they can be used. These days they don't need to be used because we have many that are, are not not outliers. But the the existence of the, the super uh, Chandrasekhar white dwarf can explain the very bright type one A supernovae. Okay. So the, uh, there's a follow-up question to that. What implication does this have for the measurement of the Hubble constant using the distance ladder? Um, and can the so-called Hubble tension be resolved using these white dwarfs? Um, I, I, think, I think the problem is that we, although the, the type 1a supernovae were instrumental in introducing the cosmological constant in the first place, because we don't, we don't understand the, the full details of the of the explosion and the relation between the um, the peak brightness and the and the decay, we can't we don't actually tend to use them anymore. So I, I think they're not going to. I think the the errors in the errors involved in the supernovae are such that they're not going to resolve the uh, the tension. But they were okay. instrumental at the beginning. Hmm. Um, there's a last question which uh, it just uh, oh oh several more suddenly. Um, what are the methods to measure the fates of white dwarfs and which one is more prominent? Uh, okay. Well, the, well, the, well certainly, the, certainly the, best, the best method is the, is the Zeeman splitting of the lines. So, so they, we see hydrogen lines in the spectrum of the white dwarf and the, the magnetic field splits those lines in the Zeeman splitting. If it's a low magnetic field, then perturbation theory tells us exactly what the splitting is. That's easy to understand. If we get to high magnetic fields, then the splitting the suggested becomes very large and the lines can actually start to move across one another. But with numerical methods, we can now model that well. There are, there are other ways. Okay. There are, um, there, we can see uh, cyclotron lines in the, um, in, uh, if particles are spiraling along the magnetic field lines. Uh, they're they're harder, to, harder to find and limited to the range of magnetic fields that we can see. So the, the Zeeman splitting is by is far and away the best method. Right. Um, there are a number of other questions that maybe we'll take only one more in the interests of time and maybe the others can be passed on to the speaker later. Okay, yeah. Uh, so,
Hear me? Yes? Okay. Um, while observing a white dwarf, how can we determine whether it is a normal white dwarf or a super Chandrasekhar Kamas limit white dwarf? Well, if, it, uh, if, it's in a, if it's in a binary system, then we're using radio velocity measurements. We could actually measure its mass. That would be that would be the the most effective way. Um, otherwise, we have to we have to make models and we have to look at what what differences it makes. And that's that's some of the work that I'm doing with the the people in Bangalore. We'll look at that. We're we're actually looking at uh, what might distinguish a super Chandra Seiko mass white dwarf from a normal white dwarf. Trouble is that they. If we if we can't actually measure the mass, they they going to look very similar. But they will be they'll be of low luminosity. But that could that could just mean that they're old. So we have to we have to think more carefully about how to distinguish them. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Tout, and thanks for answering all the questions. Uh, My pleasure. And again, once again, thank you for a very um, illuminating and uh, clear talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for thanks. Asking. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, 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 let's move on to the next uh, talk of the session. Before we do that, I just wanted to recall that Professor Chitri, of course, had a long standing interest in what happens or what goes on in the innards of the sun. And I remember several discussions with him about the outward passage of neutrinos as they make their way from you know, way inside to the outside and the scattering process they, processes they undergo and how similar or how different is it from scattering in condensed matter systems, which is more uh, uh, what I work on a little bit. Uh, in any case, the next talk will perhaps address some of these uh, questions. And this is the talk by Professor Shubhavati Goswami, uh, currently senior professor in the theoretical high energy physics uh, a group in the Physical Research Laboratory, Andabad. Uh, Professor Goswami works on neutrino oscillations and uh, uh, is the recipient of several awards, including uh, the fellowship, of course, of all three Indian Academies of Science, the Ramanujan Fellowship awarded by the DST, and the uh, Dr. P. Shield Dr. P. Memorial Award uh, awarded by NASI. Uh, uh, earlier, she held a Humboldt Fellowship and a JSPS Fellowship uh, uh, many years ago. And as I said, her current interests are in neutrino oscillations. Today, she'll talk about the solar neutrino problem in the light of helioseismically constrained fluxes. Professor Goswami. Professor Goswami, you need, you need to unmute. Yeah, am I audible now? Yes, uh, yes, you are audible. Thank you. Please Thank go ahead. Thank you, Nancy. And uh, it's, uh, it's an honor for me uh, to speak in this uh, symposium and I am very thankful to the organizers to give me this opportunity to uh, talk in this, uh, give this uh, talk. I would just like to recall my first meeting with Professor Chitre. It was in a uh, symposium in Ayuka in 1993 and uh, I was a beginning PhD student. I have just started working on solar neutrino problem and uh, in the, this symposium, uh, Professor Chitre talked about helioseismology. And uh, actually, I had no idea about helioseismology before that, because I was a beginning student. And after the symposium, I went to TIFR. I was visiting TIFR for a month. And I gave a talk there, a theory uh, seminar on solar neutrino problem, on which I have just started my research. And after my talk, Professor Chitre asked me something regarding helioseismology. And, you know, I was young, I was naive. I said, yes, I heard your talk in Ayuka. 
And uh, then uh, Professor Chitre told me, well, I was not really aiming at that. So he won't probably know that, you know, I was in Ayoka and he asked me a question and I referred to uh, his talk in Ayoka. And after that, I was visiting the astrophysics group in TIFR and I, I had uh, interactions with him. And uh, later on, uh, at that time, of course, I didn't know that we will collaborate later on a, uh, on a solar neutrino analysis using Helios histological fluxes, but that happened much later in 2001. So in this, I thought that I will uh, discuss that because you know the solar neutrino problem is more or less a resolved problem. I thought that I will uh, trace the historical development of the problem and I will uh, discuss what are the works that Professor Chitre has done in this field uh, with me or without me, whatever um, papers I could find. So with that, I will talk my talk, uh, start my talk. And, uh, you know, as um, all of uh, you may must be knowing that neutrinos uh, come from the sun and uh, the uh, advantage uh, of these neutrinos is that they are coming directly from the sun, unlike the photons, because neutrinos are very weakly interacting, so they don't get trapped. And uh, there is a similarity of that with the seismic waves, which uh, arise due to the solar oscillations and these seismic waves uh, can through seismic waves, we can also probe the interior of the sun. This is like a rotation profile of the sun. So rotation velocity profile. So there is this similarity between the neutrinos and the seismic waves. And uh, I will start with the solar neutrinos. So the solar neutrinos are, uh, solar neutrinos are produced uh, through the, when four protons fuse to the thermonuclear fusion reactions. And this occurs through uh, uh, two chain reactions. The main is the PP chain, which uh, I am showing here. And then the next, the other one is the CNO cycle, which I will show later a little bit. Uh, Professor so Goswami, uh, yes. uh, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. Is it possible to go to full screen mode? It may be I better. Uh, full screen mode, Mustansir. Professor Mustansir, I am. Um, is it not coming in full screen? Uh, uh, I mean, I, I think not, but uh, if this is the best we can do, it's, it's, it, it's good enough. I mean, no, no problem. Okay, because uh, actually, we can't even see the presentation. It's still stuck on the first slide. Oh, yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I am on the second slide now. Can you escape? Uh, can you press escape and get out of the presentation mode and present again? So I will stop share and then do again. Yes, can you try this now? So I am on full screen. Now is it showing the second one? No, it's not. Um, uh, it's a completely black, black screen. Okay. Is it showing now? It, it, it's showing, but not full screen. Um, okay, now I am not full screen. Maybe what I will do is I will switch off my video. Okay. Because uh, in case, you know, there is an internet issue. And, uh, uh, now I can do the full screen. Is it okay now? No, it's still blank. Um, okay, so, so maybe we go in the non-full screen mode. I mean, what do you say, uh, Dr. Matnagar? Yeah. You hmm. know, I have sent the slides. If yes. that can yes. be shown, I can... Just because so, since I have sent the slides to the, or just so so what you can do is actually uh, stop presenting, and when you choose the share present share screen button, you can present your entire screen. Okay. So you can stop presenting on Zoom and. So I am share screen. Present your entire screen.
Now nothing is coming, right? Yeah. Now we can see your PDF. Okay. Now let me do full screen. Now is it coming? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So I am on the slide on. Uh, so this was my class first slide, which I think you have seen. And uh, yes. so this is my second slide. So I am okay, talking about. Good. No, it's fine. Okay. Thank you. So now I will be talking about the solar neutrinos. I am starting. So these are produced through this main reaction where four protons fuse to produce two neutrinos. This occurs through a chain reaction, which is the PP chain. And depending on which reaction the neutrinos come from, we can have different type of neutrinos like the PP neutrinos or for instance, which is um, detected by the many of the experiments are this eight boron type of neutrinos. Um, so, and these neutrinos have different energy spectrum. For instance, the PP neutrinos are up to uh, 0.42 MeV and the eight boron neutrinos are of higher energy goes up to 15 MeV. So this is the solar neutrino energy spectrum. I am on my third slide. So here you can see that this is this PP neutrinos, which have the highest uh, flux, but they have a lower energy. And this green is the eight boron neutrinos, which have a higher energy. And uh, this gallium, chlorine, cameocondrate, these are different experiments about which I will talk. But the gallium experiments are sensitive to the PP neutrinos. Chlorine is to this seven beryllium, which is around a, it's a line spectrum and the eight boron neutrinos and so on. The shape is determined from nuclear physics, but the normalization depends on the standard solar model calculations. So the first detection of the solar neutrinos were uh, by, the, by the famous uh, Homestake Solar Neutrino Observatory, which uh, started in 1967 and it took data till 2002. This was pioneered by uh, Davis and Bacall, and the main aim was to probe the solar interior uh, through the neutrinos, uh, the, uh, more, more specifically the mechanism of thermonuclear uh, generation of energy in the sun. So the experiment was uh, the, uh, that, you know, the chlorine was taken in the form of a parchloroethylene and the neutrinos will be captured in chlorine and they will produce argons and argons are extracted by chemical methods. And then the number of neutrinos were counted by the radioactive decays of argon. That's why this is called a radiochemical experiment. And this chlorine was taken in terms of 600 tons of parchloroethylene. In 1968, the experiment first gave data. So the experiment will expose the, uh, the detector to for some time uh, for the sun uh, in the sun. And then depend, you know, how, the, how many days it will be exposed will depend on the uh, half-life of the radioactive decay on, of argon through which the counting will be done. So those many days, it will be um, less than that. It will be exposed and then the number of argons will be counted. And uh, as I said, this experiment had a higher threshold. These are sensitive to the eight boron neutrinos and also the seven beryllium neutrinos. And this experiment observed that only one third of the predicted solar neutrinos were observed, where the prediction was uh, due to standard solar model of uh, Bacall, uh, John Bacall, who was one of the pioneers of this experiment. And this was the starting of the solar neutrino problem. Now, at the time when the chlorine experiment gave its results, there were several conjectures. One was that the experiment is wrong because, you know, they were collecting only a handful of argon atoms from a um, uh, large uh, uh, volume of the detector fluid. And whether there is any error in that, in the chemical extraction, in the radioactive counting, then there was another conjecture that the solar model calculations are wrong because the solar model calculations were uh, done uh, through a numerical modeling of the sun uh, giving different inputs. So there are uh, possibilities that there is something wrong going there. The third uh, suggestion which was given by, um, uh, this, uh, by uh, Ponte Corvo, which was that the solar electron neutrinos are getting converted to muon or tau type of neutrinos and the detector is sensitive only to the electron type of neutrinos, so it is missing it. New experiments were planned to test these results. Now, 
In this context, I find that uh, Professor Chitre had a paper in 1977 in which he um, worked on the possibility of chemical trapping of the argon ion in the uh, capture reaction of the neutrinos by the chlorine. So this calculation of the rate assumed that the, all the ions are neutralized by electron capture and are not trapped um, when neutralization takes place. However, they concluded that if trapping does take place, the rate is much smaller than the charge neutralization rate. Therefore, this mechanism cannot explain the observed small rate of argon production in the Brookhaven solar neutrino experiment. So this was one um, study which Professor Chitre did with uh, his collaborators in 1977. And uh, he did uh, another study in 1973, which was to consider a strong centrally concentrated magnetic field in the sun and to see whether this can explain the low solar neutrino flux. So in the table one, you can see that the, uh, this is the prediction of uh, uh, his uh, model. The model one is the standard solar model and model two and three are uh, prediction from this work using different uh, magnetic uh, fields. And the main reason for this uh, reduction was that uh, when they were uh, taking a centrally concentrated field, then there was a local reduction of density, which reduced the opacity and the central temperature. And uh, that uh, reduced, you know, that resulted in a reduction of the flux. So that was one of the studies which was done by them. And um, now uh, this was one of the options to see, you know, whether the nuclear physics or the solar physics, there is something nuclear physics of the reaction, there is some problem. But as I said, new experiments were also planned to test this anomaly. And the another radiochemical experiment which was done was the used the, the neutrino capture on gallium to produce germanium and electron. Two collaborations uh, studied it. One is the SAGE collaboration in uh, Russia and one is the GALEX collaboration which was at the Gran Sasso in Italy. And the GALEX was later uh, upgraded to uh, the Gallium Neutrino Observatory, GNO. And uh, all these experiments and this gallium experiment, because this gallium reaction is sensitive to, uh, the sensitivity is 0.23 MeV, the reaction threshold. So these are sensitive to the low energy PP neutrinos, which are responsible mainly for the solar luminosity. So what this gallium experiment observed was that only half the solar neutrinos are coming, observed by theory was about 0.55. So they also confirmed the sh short form. Another experiment which joined this endeavor was the Kamiokande experiment in Japan, which was uh, using the neutrino electron scattering in a Cherenkov detector, which was filled with water. So the solar neutrinos were interacting with the water, the electrons in the water and producing another type of neutrino. This neutrino, this uh, reaction, neutrino electron scattering reaction is sensitive to both electron neutrinos and the muon and tau neutrinos, but with a reduced strength. And this was an experiment which detected the solar neutrinos in real time. The gallium and the chlorine experiment were radiochemical. So they were the exposed to the sun for some time and then they were later extracted. But here the event was recorded. In fact, this experiment uh, first pointed out that the, uh, the Kamiokande experiment that the neutrinos are indeed coming from the sun. So they could make a direction reconstruction. This ex experiment has a high energy threshold of 5 MeV. So they were sensitive only to the eight boron neutrinos. This experiment was later upgraded to the uh, super Kamiokande, which is a 50 kiloton. Kamiokande was a five kiloton water detector and super Kamiokande was a 50 kiloton water detector. And uh, both experiment observed only half the solar neutrinos. So another experiment which uh, joined in 1999 is the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory experiment, which instead of water used the heavy water. And uh, in, uh, in this, there were actual two main type of reaction. They are also sensitive to the electron uh, neutrino scattering reaction. However, the two main type of reactions were the charge current reaction where a neutrino is, a electron neutrino is captured and gives an electron and two protons 
particles and another is the neutral current to which uh, is uh, which uh, occurs for electron muon and tau neutrinos and the difference with the super kamiokande experiment is that here all the three neutrinos participate in the neutral current reaction in the with equal strength so the this is the uh, a snapshot of the solar neutrino problem the, the, so the first one is the chlorine experiment as i said the uh, yellow one is the um, theoretical prediction uh, that this uh, yellow green this uh, bar is the theoretical prediction yellow is the eight boron green is the seven beryllium and this black gives the uncertainty of the um, standard solar model calculation and this blue shows the theoretical the experimental observation so you can see for the chlorine experiment it's about one third both kamiokande and super kamiokande shows about half the neutrinos they have observed only half the neutrinos as compared to the standard solar model predictions this is the gallium experiments uh, which are um, uh, which are predict about 132 the solar neutrino unit which is a unit for cal calculating the uh, number of neutrinos captured and then this they are observing about 69 and 65 the sage and galax experiment this red is the pp neutrino so they are observing all the pp neutrinos but something may be happening to the eight boron neutrinos and this is the uh, snow uh, experiment the charge current reaction which gave its first data in 2001 here also the charge current reaction is sensitive only to the electron neutrinos and here also we can see that there is a reduction in the electron neutrino flux so what we see is that in all these experiments the observed solar neutrino flux is less than the theoretical prediction and so this is the statement of the solar neutrino problem which started with the Davis's experiment and this remained unsolved for 30 years. Davis's result came in 68 and then the snow results came in 2001, 2002. So almost so many years it remained unsolved. So now after the solar neutrino problem, I will come to heliosismology as I mentioned in the beginning. Apart from the neutrinos, information of solar interior can also come from seismic waves and which is because sun is in a state of continuous oscillations and these are acoustic in nature and helioseismology is study of sun using acoustic waves. So from the frequencies of solar oscillations, it is possible to infer the sound speed, density, composition, rotation uh, profiles of the sun, of the solar interiors. And so this can also check the correctness of the SSM by calculating this through the um, helioseismological observation. So this is a slide from a talk given by Professor Chitre in which he wrote, is there any way of checking the correctness of theoretical solar models? And uh, he writes, we can probe the solar interior with the help of diagnostics provided by neutrinos which can give us the um, indication of temperature, composition, and seismic waves, which can give us indication on sound, speed, density, and rotation. And this was measured by the Global Oscillation uh, Network Group GOG, which was a six-station network of extremely sensitive uh, uh, velocity imagers located around the Earth to obtain nearly continuous observations of the sun's five minutes oscillation. This Udaipur is the PRL uh, node of the gong uh, uh, detector, you know, PRL has a observatory in uh, Udaipur and this is the Udaipur node. So in uh, this, in 19, uh, this paper, um, uh, uh, Professor Anti and Professor Chitre uh, uh, studied the helioseismic bounds on the uh, central temperature of the sun and they also predicted the neutrino fluxes. And what they tried to examine is that whether the chlorine experiment predictions can be reproduced by these fluxes. And what they write here is that uh, in order to reduce the chlorine neutrino flux to match the observed values, the opacity needs to be reduced by a factor upwards of 1.5 by a so, uh, so the thing is that they needed the chlorine experiment predictions needed the non-standard opacities. So um, uh, this, this uh, model was updated in 1998 
in which uh, they studied the seismic inversions for temperature and chemical composition of the profiles of the solar interior. And this is again from slide of Professor Chitre that helioseismology is like, you know, from solar structure and dynamics, you can get this uh, frequency is amplitudes and splittings that is the forward method and they, they were using an inversion technique where from these uh, amplitudes frequencies and splittings one can get the structure and dynamics and uh, i am not an expert on uh, helioseismology but what we were interested in was the neutrino fluxes predicted uh, and they were close to the ssm fluxes uh, with the same opacity and so in this paper they concluded that the particle physics solution that the neutrinos are getting converted to some other neutrinos may be needed that was what their conclusion was and uh, what we did was with professor chitre we did an oscillation and Professor Antia and uh, my collaborators Sandhya Chobe and Kamalesh Kaur in Shah Institute. We worked on a global oscillation analysis of solar neutrino data with helioseismically constrained fluxes. So what happened was that in this uh, model, the, uh, the model by uh, Professor Antia and Professor Chitre, the seismic model predicted the measured fluxes were somewhat um, uh, less than the solar neutrino uh, standard solar model of Bacol and Pinsono. This is BP00 prediction. So the um, uh, Bacol and Pinsono standard solar models were updated and upgraded. So there were various series at that time we were using the BP00, which is the 2000 version. And this shaded region is the, the first shaded row is the prediction from the standard solar model of Bacol and Pinsono and the last shaded row is the prediction from the standard solar model of, uh, of the seismic model and we can see that the seismic model gives a slightly lower prediction uh, so for the um, all the um, uh, experiments. So the reason for that was uh, they used the increased value of S11, the S factor for the PP reaction and there was uh, in the uh, say SSM, the mixing just you know, beneath convection zone was neglected, which they did not neglect. So what we tried to see is that, but if, if you see with the first row compared with the first, first row, then the seismic model predictions are still not consistent with the measured fluxes. So what we tried to see is that if we combine neutrino oscillation, with uh, this uh, seismic model predicted fluxes, then how far the parameters, oscillation parameters will change. So we sought our solution in terms of oscillation parameters, including the uh, predicted fluxes from the seismic model. So uh, the, the solution of uh, in terms of neutrino oscillation requires the neutrinos to have a non-zero mass square difference and a non-zero mixing angle that is responsible for neutrino oscillation. However, uh, in the solar matter, the solar density also comes into play. And what we have is a matter effect induced oscillation. And depending on what is my mass square difference and what is my mixing angle, I can have various possibilities. So the, um, this is the, this uh, high region where the delta m square, where by delta m square, I mean the mass square difference of the two neutrino states. So what we assumed was that the electron neutrino is getting converted to some new other neutrino, say the muon or tau. This was done in a two flavor framework uh, at that time. And uh, what we assume is that the mass, these are uh, superposition of some mass states and the difference in the mass is uh, very tiny. And the solution was coming, one solution was coming with 10 to the minus four EV squared and 10 squared theta around one. So quite large mixing angle. This was called the large mixing angle solution. So the seismic model was also giving us a large mixing angle solution, but the allowed parameter region was larger. At that time, we also got a solution, which is a low delta m squared solution, which is a 10 to the minus seven EV square. But uh, later on, uh, this is uh, mainly due to art mat the matter effect in the art when the solar neutrinos pass through the art. And this solution is due to the interaction of the solar neutrinos in the sun's matter. And this is the famous Mikhiev Smirnov Wolfenstein uh, resonant flavor conversion uh, solution. Uh, Professor Goswami, uh, yes. we have a sensor here. So 
um, uh, we're approaching the end of the time. So can you? Uh, ah, yeah, I have done. Conclude? I have done, Mr. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so this is the uh, solution that we got at that time. And now only this LMA solution exists. So there was another uh, study which uh, they did uh, whether the three helium redistribution can solve the neutrino problem. Because if you see the chain, then you know there it's nuclear reaction rates and whether something like that can solve. And these black dots were various seismic models and these square boxes are the uh, experimental rates. And uh, this, uh, this is the SSM rate, this dashed box. So what their study showed was that no seismic model is consistent with the experiments. So uh, now we know that the snow um, uh, charge current, the, the, after this, the snow neutral current data came, which is sensitive to all the solar and all the three types of neutrinos. And because it is sensitive to all the three types of neutrinos, it could measure the uh, eight boron neutrino flux and it confirmed the standard solar model. Also the charge current to neutral current ratio because charge current is sensitive to electron neutrino and the neutral current is to all the three neutrinos. It showed that the neutrinos are indeed getting uh, oscillated. So this is this part I can omit. This was not about um, uh, Professor Chitri's work. So I will just end with this, uh, this uh, quote from Professor Chitri's slide on the sun. And at first sight, it would seem that the deep interior of the sun and stars is less accessible to scientific investigation than any other region of the universe. Our telescopes may probe farther and farther into the depths of space, but how can we ever obtain certain knowledge of that which is hidden behind substantial barriers. What appliance can pierce through the outer layers of a star and test the conditions within? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Goswami. Um, there are a number of questions and maybe I'll select two or three to, uh, uh, you know, uh, so that you could uh, you know, address them. The first one is, could you tell the frequency of the argon atoms de detected by Davies and Brookhaven? I'm assuming it is it was very low. And what were the error bars? Were they statistically significant? Yes, I don't remember the frequency, but you know the rate I was showing. Uh, I, yeah, here you can see that Homestead flux was this 2.56 plus minus 0.23. So this uh, SNU is a solar neutrino unit. I think it was to the minus 36 captures per second, something like that. So over the years, you know, this took data for many years. So over the years, it acquired statistics. Okay. Mm -hmm. Another question. Uh, how reliable or accurate are our measurements and experiments to detect solar seismic waves? I think they they should be quite accurate, you know, because uh, because uh, this um, these helioseismological models actually were also inconsistent with the standard solar models, and you know because I'm a neutrino person, and as you I showed that the snow data uh, snow data uh, confirmed that the eight boron uh, measurements uh, is correct, and I believe that at that time when we were doing the work that, you know, if you can see here also that the error bars were not uh, so high, at least from the solar neutrino predictions. So I think that they were quite accurate and actually they verified the standard solar models predictions. Thank you. We'll take one last question. And that is, uh, uh, do, does the change of flavor of neutrinos depend on generation process of solar neutrinos, namely PP cycle or CNO cycle? Yeah, that's a very good question, you know, because the change of flavor that is energy dependent and because the PP neutrinos have a lower energy and the eight boron neutrinos have a higher energy, actually the, for the PP neutrinos, the matter effect is not so important. So it is almost energy independent, but whereas the eight boron neutrinos depend on the, the process depends on the matter effect and depends on the energy. So yes, the conversion rate is different depending on what nutrients
neutrinos are coming. And in fact, that is the reason of this, you know, MSW effect that, uh, which is um, very beautiful because it could explain why you got half the neutrinos in gallium uh, and, you know, the PP neutrinos and uh, in chlorine, you got one third. So those kind of things could be fit, uh, featured excellently with the MSW uh, mechanism. Thank you very much, uh, Goswami, for this historical, um, you know, uh, journey. Um, just a small footnote to that, you know, you showed this 1977 paper with Banerjee and Devakaran and uh, uh, Santanam and, you know, so I just joined and um, Chitri was on the second floor, uh, Banerjee on the third floor and Devakaran on the fourth floor. <laughs> okay. And so we on the third floor would often see this triplet moving around, you know, the three theorists and Santana was experimentalist, um, you know, discussing this very work. Anyway, so I was reminded of I think that. It was an exciting time at that yeah, time. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. That's right. Okay, let's uh, uh, go on to the next uh, talk. And, uh, uh, you know, as I said earlier, Professor Chitre was a great teacher. He had a large role also in shaping students, you know, especially from the department uh, of uh, what is now called the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics. In the early days, I think it was Group Committee 2, probably. Um, and uh, there was a steady stream of students who came out from this uh, department. Many of them have gone on to very distinguished careers. Uh, and we, we are going to hear from one of them, that is Professor Ajit Kambavi. Uh, Professor Kambavi. Uh, uh, is with the Ayuka in Pune, um, uh, which he joined in 1988. He went on to become director of Ayuka, uh, uh, you know, um, let's say about uh, eight or nine years, in 2009. And uh, he, has had, uh, he has held many important um, uh, uh, assignments, including vice presidentship of the International Astronomy Union. He is a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences and NASI, former president of the Astronomical Society of India and of the Indian Association of General Relativity and Gravitation, recipient of the UGC Hari Om Vatsa Award and the Raja Ramana Fellowship, also chairman and council member of many councils of um, you know, many institutions in the country. Uh, today, Professor Kimbali will talk about tidal capture binaries and uh, I think over to you. Okay, nice is that visible? Yes. Yeah. So good afternoon. Uh, I feel very honored uh, to be invited to uh, speak at this symposium in honor of Kumar Chitre. But I cannot say that I'm very happy to be here. I would have been much happier celebrating his 85th birthday with him sitting in the audience and uh, looking upon very benignly all all that is going on. <coughs> You are a great friend, a senior colleague, and a mentor, and you have of immense help to me over the last decade or so, particularly in various ways. So I truly miss him. Now, uh, when I asked to give this talk, uh, it was not clear to me what I should be speaking on, uh, because there was very much of sort of intersection between what Kumar did and what I did with my collaborators. But then I remembered that uh, back in the 1980s, with Alak Ray and uh, uh, Antia, who is here in the audience, um, I wrote a paper on tidal capture binaries. And after that, I did some work with that with Chris Stout, who was the first speaker of this afternoon. And uh, the tidal capture binaries, the tidal capture involves stellar oscillations. I thought that I got too far from so much work that Kumar did. And therefore, I decided to speak on this topic. Now, uh, we did this work in the 1980s. After that, really not too much has happened there, though the observational situation has changed very much. This is a rather difficult area to work in. There have been papers with, <coughs> sometimes about it, uh, but it remains largely an unexplored uh, area even now, uh, given the richness of the observations. So I suppose that um, it's time people got back to it. So when I try to prepare this talk, I can see that you go back to your old PowerPoints and see what you have done before, and then you uh, and then you revise them. But in this case, it turned out that uh, I gave my talk very long ago. 
In fact, I, I remember I gave a colloquium in uh, <coughs> TIFR and then followed by a colloquium in MIT. So I, I thought I should get hold of the PPT, except that those were the days before the PowerPoint. So I needed the transferences. Now they were uh, in some unknown place in my office or somewhere in Ayuka, uh, but um, my young assistant there managed to find them. And so I was seeing them for the first time for 30 years, but they could only send me a PDF. And I made liberal use of those, uh, along with more, uh, more modern technology. So you'll see a mix of things here in my talk. So now, first of all, uh, title capture always happens um, in the core of a global cluster. Now, global clusters are remarkably beautiful objects. Uh, they have a very perfect dynamicity. They're spherical, and then they have about 10 to the 5 stars in them. And you can see here the properties of global cluster. The, the cluster shown here is what is called 47 Tuckney, taken with a 20 inch telescope. So each global cluster has about 10 to the 5 stars. It has got a radius of about 50 parsec and a core radius. So as you go down the center, it becomes denser. And the core radius is 2 parsec. And the core density is about 10 to the 5 stars per parsec cube. So most of the stars are there in the center. And then uh, the, the velocity there, so what you call the dispersion velocity is about 10 kilometers per second. All these facts are very important for us today. And global clusters are very ancient creatures, but age 2 into 10 to the 10 years, uh, which means that all the massive stars which would have been present when the clusters were formed are gone now. And the turn of mass is 0.8 solar masses, which means that all the stars with a mass greater than 0.8 times the mass of the sun um, have evolved and are now gone. And they are left behind different kinds of remnants with which we'll be <coughs> concerned with today. There are about 135 clusters in our galaxy. And uh, uh, all right, so that's good enough. Uh, so, one more picture of the like to show you. I'll keep shifting this thing around. Uh, so, you see that this is a uh, this is a, uh, image of the core of the global cluster taken with the VLT uh, in Chile. And then it is zoom. And what you see here is uh, an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, so we are, we are moving closer and closer to the cluster set. So, now what I'm going to talk to you today is about uh, not about global clusters per se. Now, global clusters are dynamically extremely interesting objects, but I'm going to talk about uh, global cluster X ray sources. So, uh, in the middle of the 1980s, uh, this was the situation that there were about 10 bright X ray sources located inside global clusters. Now, these are variable sources. Most of them were showed what about X ray, no, what are X ray bursts. And we told you that these are uh, X ray binary sources. Now, X ray binary sources come in two types those with high mass and those with low, <coughs> uh, a high mass star with a compact companion, which could either be a neutron star. Or a black hole, or they could be uh, low mass stars, uh, meaning that the mass of the star is less than the mass of the company. Now, a neutron star mass is 1.4 solar masses, a black hole mass is more than that. But uh, so we can't have a high mass X ray binary to be a black hole because all high mass stars are already evolved out. So it has to necessarily be a low mass X ray binary. And also, most of these are neutron star binaries because they are bursters. Now, X-ray bursts occur when matter piles on the surface of a neutron star. If it is a black hole, it has no surface, just an event horizon, and therefore, <coughs> you can't have a burst from a black hole. So there are various lines of evidence which show that the low mass X-ray binary, that these are low mass X-ray binary sources. <coughs> now, when, uh, when the ideas which I'm going to describe to you now, uh, first were thought of, at that time, this number would be only four uh, known uh, X ray, low mass X ray binaries or bright X ray sources inside global clusters. That was thought to be a great puzzle for the following reason. Now, look at this the ratio of the mass of in all the global clusters to the mass of a galaxy. So, global cluster typically has 10 to the 5 stars. There are about 100 global clusters, and there are about 10 to the 12 uh, stars in our galaxy. So if you assume that each star is like the sun as an approximation, then the ratio, this mass ratio is 10 to the minus 5. 
The number of uh, <coughs> X-rays exposed to globular clusters is like 10 here. And in the whole galaxy, you have about 100 Celsius of that type. So about a 10, this is actually about a 10, which means that there is an excess of 10 to the 4 X-ray sources per unit mass of globular clusters. So the question is, how did this come about? This was thought to be very interesting. So if it meant that there has to be some kind of a special formation mechanism in global clusters. And what can that be? We have seen that the clusters is a very uh, very dense environment with stars. There will, there will be a lot of compact objects there, which are remnants of past evolution of stars. And then and the dispersion velocity is very low. So which means that there could be different processes that take place. For example, you could of course say that these are all excess primordial binaries, which means that these binaries were formed in excess when the globular clusters were formed. But one can argue astrophysically that such binaries are unlikely to survive now because they would have to be very, very special. So what are the other possibilities? There could be a three-body uh, three encounter. So okay, meaning that uh, three bodies, a neutron star and a star and another body come together, or you've got a binary and then a star replaces it. It turns out that these mechanisms are all possible, and uh, but their cross sections are not sufficiently large, and they typically will not lead to the formation of close binaries. The binary which is the distance between the star and the compact object is quite small. And we need binaries to be compact because only then matter can flow from the star, uh, from the normal star to the compact object and uh, in, uh, in the, then forming exits. And so now before I go on to uh, develop the idea further, so let us see uh, for the current status. Meaning that in the 1980s, there were 10 bright X-ray sources. What happens now? First of all, there are about 25 of the low mass X-ray binaries. Most of them, a few of them are faint, but most of them are very bright. In addition to that, there are hundreds of low luminosity X-ray sources, which are discovered by mainly by the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Um, and these have been identified using space telescope data with coincident low mass X-ray binaries. Meaning that these are low mass X ray binaries which are in a quiet state. Uh, they could be cataclysmic variables, they can be active main sequence binaries, and they could also be millisecond pulsars. So, over 100 millisecond pulsars are known in the 28 globular clusters. It's quite crazy. I mean, we are very surprised when we found four uh, X ray binaries in globular clusters, but now there are 100 millisecond pulsars, and including 38 in a single cluster, which is called Tensor 5. And 25 and 47 took me. And 47 took me on the cluster I showed you a little while ago. And then the coincident LMXBs and the millisecond pulsars would have passed through a low mass X ray binary state. So we really are talking about hundreds and hundreds of low mass X ray binaries in the clusters. And we really need to find a mechanism to see how they were formed. It turns out there's a very elegant mechanism available. I mean, uh, look at this here, the, the collision, let's say between a neutron star and a normal star in a global cluster. So there are 10 to the 5 stars there. There are quite a few neutron stars. Um, and then these, um, they'll all be moving um, at random in the global cluster. And there could occasionally be such encounters. So what is happening here is that the neutron star comes in from a distance along the parabolic or hyperbolic orbit and then just goes away to infinity. But the interesting thing here is that this is a normal star, and as uh, it has got an extended, it has got a finite radius, unlike the neutron star, which has got a radius of just 10 kilometers. And so, when the neutron star is close to the perihelion, um, it will excite tides in the star. And now the tides will have some energy. And this energy must come from the orbital energy. So, the question is can the energy which goes into the tides be large enough? for um, the neutron star to be captured, because the energy in the tides must come from the orbital energy. So the idea is the following. I mean, here is a familiar gravitational and the centrifugal potential, uh, sort of point object. So you've got, a, you've got a potential well here. And so uh, an object which comes in at high speed from a distance of p on a hyperbolic orbit, the kind of thing which I'm showing here um, is, a, is a parabolic orbit where it has got almost divine zero energy at infinity, it comes in, uh, and this is the perihelion that it goes back. 
So it just turns. But now if it loses energy, it can fall into the potential value, in which case it will have a very eccentric, very elliptic orbit. And which, as it loses more and more energy to the tides, possibly, um, it will sink and it will finally get to the bottom of the potential um, where it will be in a circular orbit. Right. So, so what is the uh, what is the consequence of this? So, got a star coming in on the parabolic orbit and gets captured and then goes around the elliptical orbit and then gradually, as it loses more and more energy, assuming that the angular momentum is more or less constant. Then it will settle into a circular object. Right. So, uh, so now uh, this was uh, first uh, thought of by Clark in 1975. The excess of sources was first noticed by Carr again in 1975. And uh, then in the same year, Fabian Pringle and Reese, all three from Cambridge, uh, wrote a very elegant paper on this. It's just a two page paper which has received hundreds of citations. It's a very beautiful thing. And so, so what they talk about here is uh, a star-neutron star close encounter, energy deposited in the tides, and then the orbital energy becomes negative, and because and then the, the binary form. So here is a, a little bit of mathematics of it. So we can go to the more formal calculations later. So <clears throat> so when you have a tide, uh, there's an electricity which is produced in the tide, and that is given by this particular thing here. F is a constant which talks about the detail of the, it compares the type of passage with the frequencies. And then X here, X here is the perillion distance divided by the, by the radius of the star. So you are coming pretty close here. You'll see X is smaller than three orbits. Then the energy which it goes to the tides, I mean, again, you can, this is a approximate calculation. Uh, so here is the binding energy of the star, and you've got epsilon squared. But if this energy is greater than the energy of the neutron star at infinity, which is at the reduced mass half reduced mass into VD square, the dispersion velocity, then the total the orbital energy will become negative, and so the orbit will become down. And the condition for that is easy to show is that x must be less than or equal to 3. So which means very approximately, if the neutron star approaches the normal star, uh, with perillion distance less than three times the radius of the star, and then it will get captured. It's quite easy to uh, obtain the cutting cross section and to look at the rate of these uh, thing encounters, and then you will find that a fair number of except binaries can be produced by this process. Right. So now, uh, now I'm going to talk about the consequences of a process like this. So you see that if you if you look at numbers. Uh, the energy in the tides after the first encounter, which is approximately equal to the energy of the neutron star when we that infinite distance, is 10 to the 44 Earth per second. So the total energy deposited after circularization is like 10 to the 47 Earth per second. And so you see that the amount of energy deposited to the star uh, is very high. But if you assume that there's a tidal dissipation time scale, it's a viscous dissipation time scale, I'll come to it later. It's about 10 to the 4 years after a lot of hand waving, then the luminosity generated can be as high as 10 to the 36 Earth per second. So um, now you see that the luminosity of the sun is 4 into 10 to the 33 Earth per second. So you are generating several times the luminosity of a typical star in a global cluster because of the tidal energy which is deposited in it. And this leads to expansion of the star. And a common envelope formation at the neutron star spiral event. So this is just a summary. The, the formalism uh, can get pretty tricky. Now, this was first developed by Press and Tukotsky, and we adopted that formalism and then uh, we adopted that formalism to our own calculations. So uh, the idea here is that as, as the two stars have an encounter, uh, as the two stars have an encounter, the the rate at which energy is deposited is given by this expression, where V is d by dt, where xi is the Lagrangian displacement. This is just the force acting on it, and this is the work done by the force as the water, as the fluid in the star is pulled out into the tides. That's so just the work done. Now, uh, what you need to do is to first take the Fourier transform of the Lagrangian displacement, and then then you 
uh, you get a normal modes of the oscillation, and uh, you go through a pretty rigorous calculation, and then you can show you get an expression for the tides, which has got these parameters: neutron star mass, stellar mass, radius, and so forth. And then, um, then you have got here importantly a dimensionless function e l eta, where eta is equal to this particular dimensionless uh, constant. So you see that if you if you take a particular star star with a particular mass and a proton star, have an R minimum, then you can calculate what the TL eta and therefore you can calculate what the energy of the tides. Right? So TL eta is given by these functions. This has got the radial dependence, this has got the frequency dependence, and so forth. And um, you can uh, you go through a lot of calculations, and then what you get is uh, this function TL function here, and, and it is calculated. You need, uh, in order to get this function right, you need to get the distribution of matter in the star. And then for that, you make an approximation that the star is a polytrope. A polytrope is an optic which satisfies the polytropic equation. It gives you, so that you know, uh, you can compute the full structure of the star. And there are two uh, values of the polytropic index that you use, 1.53. Um, n is equal to 1.5 is the important one here for us today. Because the stars in the globular cluster are low mass stars, they are very convective. And when they're convective, the structure of a convective star can be pretty well approximated by n is equal to 1.5 polytrop. And then it turns out that you need to, you only need to consider one mode, which is L is equal to 2, because the earlier modes, L is equal to 0 and 1, don't make a contribution. And beyond 2, the contribution goes down to the steep. Right, so, so life is not as difficult as it could have been. So now uh, you can do practical calculations using this particular dimension, this function. So, so what is the what is the tidal energy which is deposited as a uh, tidal energy is deposited as a function uh, of R minimum? There's the initial minimum distance of approach. Right, so so we know that it has got to be about less than three for tidal capture, and then um, so you see here this is a curve. For n is equal to 1.5 to the curve by n is equal to 3. So you see that the tidal energy deposited in the first encounter can be pretty large. Okay, and then the orbital periods, and you see the orbital periods go from sub one year, 10 to the 6 seconds, to about 10 to the 10 seconds. Okay, for this particular range of the minimum radius. Now, here's a, um, I, I was reminded when I looked at the diagrams. Then I have drawn them all freehand. Okay, meaning actually I sat down, put in the points, and drawn do, do them with a pencil, and then later got them inked. Okay, because gra graphic systems are not easily available in those days, and uh, so if you look very carefully, you see some jagged edges to the curves. And so, so you see here uh, now, for example, what we do is that you take successive encounters. So in the first encounter. Uh, you get an ellipse because the thing has been captured. It's a highly eccentric ellipse. In subsequent encounter, it starts slowly starts getting circularized. We can't actually go to a circle because our approximations break down at that stage. But even before that, you see, um, you, you see here, for example, uh, now uh, you get the time in seconds over which uh, the orbits take place and then the amount of energy which is deposited. And after circularization, what would be the amount of energy which is deposited? And what would be the tidal luminosity compared to the stellar luminosity? And you see that you, you easily get several, a factor of several hundred, it, it even builds up to a thousand. So you're going, you're depositing a great deal of energy in the sun. Uh, Professor Kimberly, uh, yeah? sensor here, uh, I'm flagging the time. So yes. can you begin to uh, conclude? Yes, I'm, I'm, I can finish very soon, in a few minutes. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. So you see that this, um, so here, um, you've got a distribution of the energy in the star for n is equal to 1.5. Um, so you see that much of the energy is towards the outer portions of the star. Okay, which is what makes uh, the possibilities so uh, interesting. Now, um, now given, given all these rigorous calculations, we know how much energy is deposited, but then what happens to the star? Okay, so that depends upon many different time scales. I don't have the time to explain them to you, but you have got a viscous time scale, a viscous time scale for which the energy in the tides is stabilized because of viscosity, because of viscous drag. 
you have got the Kelvin Helmholtz time scale, from over which from the energy in the star settles down and it comes to a new, it moves towards a new equilibrium. You have got a spiral in time scale, where because of the formation of the common umbrella, the neutron star spirals in the star because of frictional drag. Then you've got the ejection time scale where the common envelope is ejected. And then you have got a time scale in which the energy which is there in the envelope is transported out. So when you uh, when you uh, look at all these time scales and see what is the physics possible, you see the, so the answer is that you've got the viscous dissipation of tidal energy, the star expands, and then the expansion of the star leads to a filling of the ratio. The ratio occurs when you've got a binary system. Okay, which leads to accretion of matter on to the neutron star, and then uh, there could be the formation of a common envelope. So when you when you consider the different time scales, that what are the different possibilities, uh, uh, you get very interesting uh, results. Okay, so first of all, uh, when the spiraling in time scale is very much longer than the viscous time scale, then you just get a detached spiral, no interest there. But when the spiral engine is very fast, then uh, what happens is that you could just have the star there, a common envelope is formed, and the neutron star quickly spirals into the star and goes to the center. And then it is surrounded by the whole star. And that is known as a Thorn Zipko object. Okay, and then uh, Thorn will be a speaker in this, uh, in this symposium here, a Thorn Zipko object, which, uh, which appears like a red supergiant star. But on the other tracks, uh, you can get a common envelope which is which is uh, ejected very fast. In which case, the remnant is a star fish, uh, filling the Roche lobe from which accretion takes place on the neutron star, so that you get a low mass exterior. But in other cases, where the spiraling unit is uh, pretty rapid, then uh, but but the ejection time scale is small. So, so the neutron star spirals, it ejects matter by giving it more and more energy, and then the matter gets thrown out. And finally, all that you get is a neutron star, which is surrounded by a small amount of matter, which could be in the form of a massive disk. So you see that the, the tidal capture is a pretty well understood process, but what happens after tidal capture is far from understood, except that you know that there are all these very exciting possibilities of forming low mass ultraviolet and so many other different kinds of objects. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kimbabi, for that uh, talk. Very nice. Uh, there are a couple of questions, and I'll just uh, uh, read them out. Uh, uh, could you explain the significance of majority of contributions coming from only L equal to two mode? Pardon me? Uh, the, oh, why why the majority is coming yeah. only from the eligible two mode? Yes. Okay. Right. Uh, well, what happens is that if you if you actually look at the details of the expansion, you find that L is equal to zero simply adds a constant to the gravitational potential. L is equal to one actually does not lead to any tidal energy. Um, and then when you go beyond L is equal to three, you actually find that for L is equal to three, for example, the energy deposited is only ten percent of an L is equal to two, and then it it diminishes even more rapidly afterwards. It is just a consequence of the mathematical structure of the expansion. Because there are powers of R min by R star raised to 12 plus 1 and so on. Okay, thanks. Uh, one more, uh, uh, another question. Are there studies of contact collisions of stars where they could chip off some matter from each other and cause transient flares? Is it possible to observe such flares from globular clusters? Um, yes. You see, uh, the thing is that just like you can get a compact object, normal star binary, you could also get a, a two star binary. I mean, the, the, both could be normal star. There's no problem there at all. Except that most of the collisions take place in the center of the globular cluster, and then they're very difficult to see. But um, but there are, you see that an extreme case of tidal uh, wrecking of the star happens in the center of our galaxy. Now, Martin Rees had written a paper very long ago where uh, as a star moves out the center of the galaxy because of the tidal forces, it gets, uh, the matter gets uh, sort of, it, it, it just gets thrown apart. And that can lead to very energetic processes. Now, those have actually been observed. So all of this could be observed if you had uh, the observational possibility. Thank you. 
Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Kambavi, for a very, very illuminating talk. Thank you. Thank you. So at this stage, maybe I would like to thank all the three speakers, all three speakers in the session for very fine talks, for you know, very uh, illuminating different uh, aspects of uh, which would have been in, of great interest to Professor Jitri. I'm sure had he been here, he would have enjoyed this session as much as we did. Thank you. Over to the organizers. Thank you, Professor Mustafa. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bama. Thank you. I think uh, we will proceed for the break now and we meet uh, again at 4.30. Okay, thank you.